Well, good evening, everyone. It's uh, so good to see you. I want to welcome those of you who are here tonight with us and those who are watching at home on our 6 p.m. live stream. It's always a joy to be with you. And I want to invite you to take out your teaching outlines on this Palm Sunday. And, you know, Palm Sunday is special for, for many reasons. And um, people have lots of different, I guess, ideas about Palm Sunday. I, I had shared this at our uh, previous two services today that um, somebody said, Man, that's a great day to go to church. They, they give something out when you come, like kind of like bobblehead day at Yankee Stadium, and you get something for coming. Well, I said it's a little bit more significant than that, okay? And um, you might take the palm that you get on the way home and make a cross with it or make something fancy with it. As I said last week, no matter where you put it in your car, it's not going to exempt you from getting one of those camera tickets, just so you know, okay? No matter how fancy you are with making... Uh, those palm crosses, but but Palm Sunday does carry with it a, a particular significance, uh, being that it's an opportunity, if you will, for us to reset our focus, to circle the wagons, if you will, concerning our mind and our heart as it relates to God, to put our focus truly on what matters most, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, the cross, and the resurrection. And Palm Sunday ushers all of that into motion. Um, Palm Sunday is significant for several reasons. And so I want to direct your attention uh, this evening to Matthew's account. You know, uh, there's all four Gospels listed, and so I, I just rotate it every four years. And so um, we're in Matthew's Gospel this year. And so I want to direct your attention to the 21st chapter, uh, starting in verse 1, we read about... Uh, Jesus' triumphal entry, and as you find your place there, again, remember uh, the, the context and the biography of each author. Matthew, um, a former tax collector, he has an inside track with Rome because of his profession, but he's also uh, somebody who has a deep Jewish, genuine heritage. And so, for some reason, he, he saw the hypocrisy of what was taking place um, in his own religion, his own faith, and that led him to go collect taxes for the enemy. And then, of course, Jesus calls him, and Matthew's name means a gift of God. And now, um, he, God blesses him to write and this gospel account. And we have here the first Palm Sunday recorded for us here in Matthew's Gospel. And so starting in verse 1, what I'll do is if these verses aren't in your notes um, or on the screen, I'll read it and go through it, and it'll give us a context for where we will begin this evening. So starting in verse 1, this is what we read in Matthew's Gospel. When they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus then sent two disciples telling them, go into the village ahead of you, at once you will find a donkey tied there with the foal. Untie them and bring them to me. Verse 3, if anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. Now verse 4, this took place so that what was spoken through the prophet might be fulfilled. And so what we're going to see is in the Palm Sunday account, several important prophecies that would have to fit to a T for um, whoever was going to be the Messiah to fulfill. And of course, Jesus checks all of those boxes. And here's one of those prophecies. Tell uh, daughter Zion, see your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the fall of a donkey. Verse 6, the disciples went and did just as Jesus directed them. They brought the donkey and its fall, then laid their clothes on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their clothes on the road. Others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them on the road. John's gospel tells us that those branches were indeed palm branches. Verse 9 says, Then the crowds who went ahead of him and those who followed, now listen to what they shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Another Old Testament quote. Now, Hosanna, as we will see when we go through this passage this evening, means, it's a Hebrew expression that means, save us now. And referring to Jesus as the son of David ties him to the promised Messiah. Then verse 10, when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in an uproar, saying, 
who is this? And the crowds were saying, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Now, uh, right there, you see certain facts, Jesus coming into Jerusalem. And when you think about the context and you study the Gospels, all throughout the ministry of Christ, he always tell, told people after he healed them, I think of uh, probably one of the most famous accounts was the leper. After he healed the leper, he said, what? Go tell no one. You might remember when he fed the 5,000 plus women and children, they wanted to make him king. He said no. Why was that? Because he wasn't ready yet to be presented as the king. But now all that changes. Jesus, as it was, was going public with the mission. He is going into Jerusalem just as the prophecies of the Old Testament. And again, this would be very significant to the Jewish people of their day. They were waiting for the Messiah to come, and he was fulfilling, literally, prophecies that were written hundreds of years ago, Zechariah 9, 9, Psalm 118, right there before their eyes, and the people are enthralled, and you and I would be too over what's going on, because they're thinking in their mind, this is great, the Messiah is going to come, and he's going to overthrow the yoke of the Roman Empire. Because remember, uh, Ro the Roman guard, the Roman army was occupying the holy city, um, and their thought was, great, he's going to overthrow the Antonio Fortress and uh, the Jewish people will reign. They think of David and his majestic conquering victory after victory, and Jesus is going to be even greater than David. And so they're thinking all these things, and some of the same people that were chanting, as you know, Hosanna on Palm Sunday, would be the same people chanting, crucify him on Good Friday. And so when you begin to put all of this together and you consider uh, the palm and you consider the chant of Hosanna, something very significant is going on, but it's not what the people think. See, Palm Sunday is significant from God's standpoint because he was sending his son, presenting his son as the king of kings and the lord of lords to close the gap that exists between people and God. And that's what we want to focus our time on this evening. We want to talk about closing our gap with God. And maybe you have felt distance in your life with God. Has anybody ever felt distant from God? You know, maybe you have. And so our goal this evening is to go from maybe distracted, distant, and dull to full, uh, to faithful, okay, and to focused. And God was presenting his son to close the gap. And obviously the gap was closed because Christ goes to the cross, dies for our sins, on the third day he raised again from the dead. And so we have this relationship with God. But it's possible as a believer, it's possible even as a faithful Christian, to experience times of dullness, times of dryness, times of doubt in your life, uh, when you experience distance for whatever reason, and we'll cover a couple of them tonight, and so Palm Sunday, uh, Jesus coming to close the gap as it were. And so one of the very first things that Jesus does when he comes into the holy city, and this is where we'll focus our time for the next few minutes together, is he's going to go to the temple. And you remember at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he went into the temple, the clean house, because uh, things were going on in there that shouldn't have been. And sadly, not much has changed. And he's going to go to the temple, and I believe the temple is going to symbolize for you and I our own life and our own heart. Because the first priority of heaven was to go to the house of worship and to make sure that that was right. Because out of that, everything healthy flows. And so we pick it up now in verse 12, right on the heels of Jesus coming into the holy city. Now, was this a few hours after he came in? Was it the next day? I think it was more like a few hours. His first order of business as he comes into the holy city was to close the gap that you and I have with God and for these people. And so starting in verse 12, we pick it up. And these verses are in your notes, and they're on the screen as well. It says, Jesus went into the temple... And he threw out all those buying and selling. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the chairs of those selling doves. Now stop right there. You might be going, what in the world is going on? Even if you're new to the Bible, you've been uh, through the scriptures many times, what is going on? This is the first thing that Jesus does when he comes into Jerusalem? Yes. Why? Well, sadly, the high priest, uh, Anaphis and his sons, had come up with a scheme because understand the chronological context. This is what we know to be Palm Sunday, what they know to be, the Jewish people, 
as the day they would bring their lambs to be inspected for the Passover that was coming. And so if you were a Jew who was making a pilgrimage to the holy city uh, and you were going to offer a sacrifice, whether it be a lamb, if you could afford it, or a dove, you had to present that animal in the temple to the high priest and they would either say, okay, this is without blemish, it can be used, or it can't be used. Well, guess what the high priest did? If Let's just put it in our context. We're in New Dorp, by the way. Everybody knows you're in New Dorp, okay? Just so you know, okay? The plane's already left. We're already in the air, okay? We're getting ready to hit 35,000 feet, so it's a little too late to get off the plane. You might be on the wrong plane, but you're here anyway, okay? And I hear the peanuts and soda's good, okay? The stewardess will be around in just a moment. No, not really, but... If you're in New Dorp, and this is where the temple is, and say you're from, somebody's from Grant City, somebody's from Duncan Hills, or maybe the South Shore, New Jersey, or Brooklyn, wherever people might come, and you brought your animal here to be inspected, because again, that was a part of the Jewish faith, and we study it in the book of Leviticus, that you had to present a sacrifice, a yearly sacrifice, a lamb, and the blood of the lamb would cover your family. That's why Jesus is referred to and called, he is the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. A once and done sacrifice thankfully but prior to the cross people year after year would bring a sacrifice and they would bring this lamb and the lamb would be inspected by the high priest and guess what they did you brought your lamb from grand city guess what rejected you bought your lamb from somewhere else on the south Shore? rejected now what does that mean well you now have to buy a lamb from them and you might say, okay, well, no big deal. I'll buy their lamb. I'm, I'm here. I might as well buy it. Well, guess what the problem was with buying their lamb? They charged you three times the cost. You might say, okay, I got to do what I got to do. And so you go into your wallet, and you're going you're gonna to pay three times the cost. Well, guess what? You had a different currency from where you lived. So then they hit you with three to four times of an upcharge on the currency exchange. So they got you coming, and they got you going. And you might say, well, why are there doves mentioned here? Well, the doves were for people who couldn't afford to buy a lamb. Similar to when Joseph and Mary presented a sacrifice for Jesus when he was first born, they presented two turtle doves. That didn't come from the 12 Days of Christmas song. That came from here. And so they had it covered. You know, if you could afford the lamb, great. If you couldn't, you could shop at the dollar store and get yourself a dove and you're fine. And so when Jesus comes into the temple, now you can see why he's so angry. Because this is supposed to be a place of worship. They've turned it into some money-making Ponzi scheme. And the last time I checked, that's not what church, and that certainly wasn't what the temple was to be about. And if the temple's not right, if the church isn't right, how are the people going to be right? And when, the, when that's not right, there's going to be a distance with God. Now, what does Jesus say? So his actions speak very loud. He's overturning tables and chairs. Notice he doesn't do anything to the doves. He likes the doves. It's the people who are selling the doves. Okay, keep that in mind. Okay. Verse 13, he said to them. Now, this is significant because what we're going to have here is a combination of two Old Testament quotes, Isaiah 56, 7 and Jeremiah 7, 11. Okay, this is what it says. It is written. Now, Matthew um, has more quotations than all of the other three gospel writers combined. Again, you remember I told you at the top, because of his Jewish heritage, and he was his name, Matthew Levi, he was very um, committed, very involved with the faith. And so um, he has a lot of Old Testament quotes from Jesus. And here's one of them here. Jesus said, it is written, my house shall be called, and finish it with me, a house of prayer. My house shall be called a house of prayer. Now, why would Jesus have to tell them that? Because they weren't praying. They're too busy selling animals and getting over on people. They're too busy charging three to four times the exchange rate on the currency. They're even hoodwinking the poor people with the, with the doves, okay? They're too busy doing that. And I'm sure there were prayers going on, but they weren't sincere. Because God sees past all of the waxing poetically that we might do with a prayer. God sees the heart. And then this next part, you've made it into a den of thieves. And that's from Jeremiah 7.11. And it, you might want to uh, go research that chapter. But there, Jeremiah is standing at the gate of the temple in his time. And he is saying that God isn't going to hear your prayers because they were treating people unjustly. And see, you can't 
out of one side of your mouth, praise God, and on the other side of your mouth, curse people. Uh, you can't have your hands up praising God, but then you're also using your hands to, to cheat people and slap people around. That's what was going on in Jeremiah's day. And Jesus could have chosen any Old Testament quote from a prophet, he chooses this one. You've turned my house, supposed to be a house of prayer, you've turned it into a den of thieves. Now, how many of you have seen the, the Rocky movies, right? Certainly you saw one of the 50 that were made, right? Well, I think it's Rocky three. when, you remember Rocky, he, he, he becomes the heavyweight champ. And he has to become, he has, he's going to fight Clubber Lang. And he has a lot of success. He, now he has money, he's coming to money because he's the champ. And you might recall that he's training, he's supposed to be training in the, the, the gym that he trained before in, but what is he doing? He's shooting commercials. Imagine, he couldn't even talk, he's shooting commercials. It was ridiculous. And so there he is, he's, he's doing commercials. Now Mick comes in, his trainer, remember little Mick, and Mick sees what's going on, and Mick quotes what we know to be this verse here. You know, you've turned this into a den of thieves, a den of robbers. This is supposed to be the gym where you're working out, and you've perverted it by doing what you're doing. And that's what was happening here in the temple. The temple was to be a place where people were building their spiritual muscles, seeking God, getting on their knees. But it became nothing more than pretense in a show, and it was presenting distance. And so if you want to close the gap with God, it's very important that you locate and you call out what might be causing distance with you and God. And so write this first principle down in your notes, if you will. Identify what is causing distance with God. Can you hear that with me? Identify what is causing distance with God. There might be something in your life very similar to this passage that is causing unnecessary distance. It's putting an unnecessary gap between you and God. Now, why do we say unnecessary? Because Christ didn't go to the cross and die for my sins and your sins, that we would have what we might refer to as a days of obligation relationship with God, that we kind of check in around the holidays and then we're good to the next one. Or we only talk to God when we need something and everything else in between. See, perhaps a good thing to do, and that's one of the beautiful things about, that's why I love Palm Sunday. And I commend you for being here tonight and for those listening. The neat thing about Palm Sunday is that it gives you and I an opportunity to refocus and set our minds and hearts on what matters most. And so you might want to pray uh, starting tonight and over the next couple of days leading up to Good Friday, which we invite you to join us at and Easter Sunday. You might want to pray and say this prayer tonight just between you and God. Very simple. And here it is. God, overturn some tables in my life. Can you say that with me? God, overturn some tables in her life, his life. No, no, my life, my life. See, we're good at that. We want, you know, oh God, you got to do this for this person. And you got to, oh God, you got to take care of this person. Get this person a flat tire. I can't stand them. You know, what if we, what if we got along with God and we just, instead of focusing on what everybody else and how terrible everybody, what if we said, God, look at my life. God, look at my heart. What tables need to be overturned in this life? And I want to submit to you several things that are happening in this passage, and then I'll give a couple things that are what I will refer to as daily distance makers. But right here in your notes, uh, these are a couple of the tables that Jesus was overturning, figuratively speaking, well, maybe literally speaking here in this passage, hypocrisy. Can you see that one with me? Hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is nothing but pretense. It's pretending to be morally sound or being some type of religious zealot, but yet you're not really who you say you are. You know lots of people like that. They quote the verses, they sing the songs, they got the t-shirt, but they're not living it out. And that is what is happening here in this passage. They're supposed to be the religious leaders, and the temple has become, again, their Ponzi scheme of religiosity, charging people coming and going. Hypocrisy. And no wonder why Jesus, and Matthew's the one who gives us that word in his gospel, recording it of Jesus. Again, you look at the gospels, and there's a good way to study them. When you, It's called harmonizing the gospels, looking at all four of them. And you see Matthew uses the word hypocrite that Jesus used more than anybody else because Matthew, again, was a Jew, a committed Jew in his faith, and he saw the hypocrisy so much so that he went to work for the enemy. And so hypocrisy will always 
put distance between you and God. You could fool everybody else. See, there's a lot of people that are fooling people. They look good. They might even, they, they might even be the, a pastor of a church. And they looked the apart. They might even smell good. You know, the cheap pastor cologne. I don't use that cologne, by the way. I don't use that cologne. Yeah, I'm, I don't use that cologne. But, you know, they can look the part, smell the part, walk the part. But you know what? God sees the heart. Man looks at the outward appearance, but God sees the heart. And God sees it. And I'm sure there were people who thought, wow, this is so great. But it was not lining up with God, and so much so that Jesus addressed it first when he came into the temple. Secondly, and we mentioned this just a few moments ago, prayerlessness. Can you say that with me? Prayerlessness. Again, why did Jesus have to say, my house shall be called the house of prayer? Because they weren't doing it. That's why. And God's house should be a house of prayer. It should be a place where people are coming to pray and to seek God. And we'll explain in just a moment a very, very high level of prayer, and we're going to want to adopt that. And then here's the last one. Uh, well, actually, the, next, uh, the third one, rather, uh, irreverence. Can you say that with me? Irreverence. Now, what is irreverence? It's a lack of respect. And the fact that they're doing this in God's house is a lack of respect to a holy God. You know, even the church, you know, you want to welcome everybody. Everybody's welcome to come. But if somebody's going to come and be disorderly in God's house, they're not welcome. You know why? Because this isn't a circus. It's a service. It's to honor God. And there are some people that come from denominational backgrounds where they think they have to be the loudest person. And who's that about? That's about them. Let's everybody look at them. And the last time I checked, we're here to worship God, not people. And so it's so vital that we have a reverent heart. Why? Because God is not going to change somebody who's not willing to be surrendered to him on his terms. And so I, when I study the Gospels, I don't see anybody being disrespectful to Jesus and them being healed. There has to be some type of reverence that somebody has, even if in its infancy, but that was lacking here in the temple and sometimes it lacks here in the churches of America, and it should never be, because that will put distance between the believer, the church, and God. And then, of course, dishonesty. Uh, there was a lot of that going on here, and again, Jeremiah 7 gives us that in the Old Testament, and Jesus says, that's what you're doing here. You are, and this word, the, you know, being thieves, um, it, it ties to the word that we might understand as being a klepto, you know, somebody who takes. And that's what they were about. We already know Jesus condemned them for getting over on widows. Remember, they were taking widows' properties, these, the, these same religious leaders. Okay, I tell you, you don't, you don't want to hang out with these guys. Watch out. And so they were thieves. They were scoundrels, okay? And uh, they, they were doing whatever they could to hoodwink the public, to line their own pockets, and that was causing distance, okay? Now, that was what was going on in this passage. Let me bring uh, before you some daily distance makers, things that you and I might struggle with. You'll notice this to the right of your notes right here down below there. Unconfessed sin. Can you say that with me? Unconfessed sin. You may have noticed that when you get on your knees and confess your sins to God, that closes the gap real quick. Have you ever noticed that? Who's here ever had confession and prayed before God? Okay. All right, well, if you have, you better start doing it. That's why you've, you, you, your shoulders are so low and hanging. You've got to get rid of your sin, and you can only get rid of it by going to Christ. You don't got to go to a penny, penalty box. You don't have to go to con the confession booth. Christ went to the cross. There's one mediator between God and man, and that is Christ Jesus, uh, Timothy's epistle tells us. And so when you and I come to a holy God on his terms, we can, listen to this, experience forgiveness. Um, you don't have to pay for it. You don't have to earn it. It's already been given to you. But we need to come. We're told in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, that if we confess our sins, that God, that Jesus, is faithful to forgive us of our sins. And so God has come to close the gap. But again, as believers, no matter who you are, we're going to sin. We're going to mess up. All of us are. And when you confess your sins to God, when you keep short accounts with God, that closes the gap real quick. And so we don't want to live in sin. We don't want to choose the ways of this world. And so we want to look at that as a distance maker, and we want to have confession. Selfishness, okay? That's a big one. When we're a selfish person, that's going to put distance between us and God. Because God, the way he made us, our, our very makeup, mentally, emotionally speaking, sociologically speaking, God has made us to be a giver. 
that, that, that we are more alive, that our brain is more active. You know, the neurotransmitters in this computer that God, but the best computer around, your brain, God has, has made you just to light up when you're able to give back. And so when we're selfish, it actually is unhealthy to live that way. And you probably could look at periods in your life when you did that, and you would like to get rid of those from your mind. But guess what? God's already forgiven you of those. So why go forward being anything less um, than selfless? We don't want to be selfish. And then idolatry. Can you say that with me? Idolatry. Now, idolatry means to put something before God. There are many people that so many of things come before God, and certainly that's not how you want to live. Um, we don't want to be in disobedience to God. God needs to be the center of our life. In fact, you know, there's a lot of good things in our life, and family, and, and maybe your occupation, and your hobbies, and friends, all those things. Nothing wrong with those things, um, but those things need to revolve around God, not the other way around. And you will never regret, never regret being obedient and giving to God that way. In fact, God will bless you and I, and we're blessed to be a blessing anyway. And then pride. Can you say that one with me? Pride. Oh, that gets in the way. Pride just gets in the way. You know, we're told repeatedly in the Scriptures that God opposes the prideful, but he gives grace to the humble. If you're going to be and enjoy a close proximity relationship with God, we have to give our pride over to him. Because that will create, again, unnecessary distance that will prove to be ultimately unproductive as well. And then here's the last one, pain. Can you say that with me? Pain. Now, what do we mean by that? Well, bad things, and I think we all know this, bad things happen to good people. And there could be the pain of a loss of somebody we love, whether it was recent or many years ago. It could be something egregious that was done, abuse or whatever. And that pain could cause us to question our faith. You might say, is it okay that we say that? You, yes, you should. You should be honest and share that. God would rather you and I be transparent than to put up some religious veneer and, you know, pretense. He would rather us come to him just as we are so that he can bring healing in our life. That could put distance, without even realizing it, distance between us and God. And so we want to identify what is causing distance. And we want to give that over to him if we're going to close the gap. Now, how does this story wind up? Again, Jesus entering the holy city. He goes into the temple. He overturns the tables of the money changers. As I said, we should be praying this week leading up to Good Friday. Lord, overturn some tables in my life. Overturn whatever's causing, whatever I'm doing to cause distance. And whatever pains I have, show me what they are so I can give them over to you. But how does this story wind up now as we identify these potential causes for distance? Well, what's going to happen here is something very significant. Because when you take out the trash, now you have room in the house, right? You ever notice that when you do some spring? You, you, wow, look at all this room I got. And all of us have these little tiny homes here on Staten Island, right? But look at all this room I got. Well, Jesus is taking out the trash in the temple. And now the good stuff has its place. Look what it says now in verse 14. In fact, why don't you read this verse with me? It's so beautiful, okay? Together. The blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. Now, before we go any further, I don't want the people, the good people who are watching at home, to think I'm in a library tonight, okay, that we're in the church. So you could be a little bit louder as we say this verse, okay? All right, I just want to let you know. It's not a library, okay? So you could, all right, so, so here we go. Let's say again, because this, this is, this is, I want to just tell you, let me tell you ahead of time. Maybe it'll help you out a little bit more. This, what we're going to read, is a foreshadowing of the ministry of Christ. Um, and really, it's also symbolic of what he's already done and what's to come with his second coming. And so let's say this again together, verse 14. The blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. Very good. Very, you're all hired, okay? You're all welcome back, okay, to the next service, okay? What was the last service today? Next Good Friday. You're all welcome back, okay? The blind and the lame. Now, when you look at that next phrase, they came to him in the temple. Looking at this in the Greek manuscript, which originally the, the scriptures are written, they weren't written originally in English, okay? Came to him in the temple. You know what that's telling us? That they weren't in the temple. Why aren't they in the temple? Why are these people not allowed in the temple? Well, let me tell you why they're not allowed. 
because the religious leaders didn't want to be bothered with them. That's why. They considered the blind to be cursed by God. They considered the lame that that was the finger of God on their life. That's why they were the way they were, and they were not allowed in the temple. But now that the tables have been overturned, there's room for the people that need to be in the temple. And these people need to be there. The blind and lame came in, and then how beautiful is this? He healed them. And that is representative of the ministry of Christ, that he has come to bring healing. Now, a lot of times people just focus on physical healing, but if all you ever do is focus on physical healing, you're missing the boat. Because you can get healed from something tonight, and guess what? One day, unless the Lord returns in your lifetime, you're going to die from something else anyway. The greater healing that this is symbolic of is the healing from sin. That Christ has came and he paid the price in full for me and for you. See, one time we were all blind and we couldn't see. One time we were all deaf and we couldn't hear God. One time we all couldn't walk. One time we were all dead to sin. But Christ paid for it in full. And there is no sacrament, there is no religion, there is no ritual that could atone for your sin. For again, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ who has paid for my sins and your sins in full. And as God would have it on the Passover day that was coming, Good Friday, prior to that, this was the day that people would bring their lamb to be inspected. And the very lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world is right in front of them. And again, these same people who were chanting Hosanna would be the same people chanting crucify him a few days later. But not these other guests that are in here. Look what it now says in verse 15. Now, when the chief priest, now, when the chief priest and the scribes saw the wonders, now the wonders, that's a, those are miracles, by the way. This is a miracle. These are amazing miracles. We just read, oh, the blind lamb came in, he healed him, big old deal. No. When he healed somebody who is blind, when I look at the scriptures, I don't see it says, and Jesus healed blind Bartimaeus. And he said, Bartimaeus, wear a patch on your eyes for eight to ten weeks and go get physical therapy. Here's a script. He didn't say that. When Jesus healed you, he healed you immediately. It was not like these fakes on television where the guy gets touched and he starts dancing all around the stage. First of all, um, that's bad dancing right there. We'll tell you that right now. Okay? That's terrible dancing. And number two, that's, that's fraudulent. And that comes from the pits of hell. When Jesus healed, he healed instantly. And so whether it was blindness, whether it was people who had deformities with their legs, whether it was people who had some type of palsy, whether it was people who had some type of spina bifida, whatever it might have been that contributed to their medical impairment, it was healed, listen, immediately. There was no gap. There was no time. There was no come back in two weeks. And call, no, it was none of that. Healed immediately. And when the chief priests and scribes saw it, they saw the wonders, you, you would think they would be happy about this, that he did. And now listen to this next group we're going to meet. And the children shouting in the temple. So the children are shouting in the temple, which means, and, and you know, children have big mouths. You ever notice that? Okay, they can really project. And so they're shouting over these people because we found out they're not happy about what's going on, the chief priests and the leaders. The children shouting in the temple... Hosanna to the son of David. It says they were indignant, not the children, the chief priests. They were upset that the children were cheering Jesus on, that they were giving praise, that people were being healed. And now verse 16, Jesus is going to have an interaction with these religious leaders again. And, it's, and they said to him, to, to Jesus, the religious leaders, do you hear what these children are saying? Do you hear what they're saying? And then Jesus replied, yes. Have you never read? Now, let me tell you something. That is a proverbial slap in the face to them. Have you never read? Well, of course they've read the Bible, the first, uh, to what they know it to be at this juncture, the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, the law of Moses, and whatever writings of the prophets they have at their disposal. Obviously, the book of Isaiah comes to mind and others. So whatever they have at their disposal at that particular juncture in history, have you never read? Again, that was like a, that was, that was, a, that was sarcasm. There. Of course they read it. But the problem is, is they read it, but they didn't believe it. Because uh, you do the parts of the Bible you believe. You may have seen that connection in your own life. And then Jesus says, you have prepared praise from the mouths of infants and nursing babes. Now, wait a minute. 
How could babies talk? Were babies now talking in an adult voice? No, he's God, and he sees their heart. And whatever they're, you know, you know how babies are when they talk, you know, ga, ga, goo, goo, and, and, oh, they said my name. They didn't say your name. Their diaper needs to be changed, okay? Calm down, okay? They're not, they're not talking fully yet. They're nursing still. What do you mean? They're, they're, come on, let's, let's, be honest, let's be honest here. So, you know, whatever goo, goo, and ga, ga they were saying, Jesus understood their heart, and they had, and that word preferred, uh, prepared means perfect. It perfect praise. Now, why was their praise perfect? Because they're perfect? No. Now, all children up to a certain age are covered under grace. That if a child dies in the womb for whatever reason, or a child dies after they're born for whatever reason, I wrote about this in a devotion several weeks ago. They are safe in the care and in the arms of Almighty God. It's a beautiful thing. We see it all throughout the scriptures. You have to look, and it's, it's very clear. And uh, maybe I'll do a video devotion on it um, just for some people who, who might need to see that and, and just get some relief. But the fact that these babies here are praising God this way and also whatever other children are there, out of their mouths comes perfect praise. Why? Because their prayer is understood to be right in line because they're rejoicing over what's going on about Jesus giving to these people and these people, as it were, losing whatever infirmity they have. And it's something that we want to put our eye on because a beautiful prayer is this. You might want to jot this down. Now, let me say this. As I get ready to tell you this, this is going to seem to you to be countercultural, okay? Because we live in a day and age where everybody wants to get, 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 get. So here it is. Pray not to gain, but to lose. Can you say that with me? Pray not to gain, but to lose. You know, you saying, what in the world are you talking about? I got to pray to lose? I, what do I got to lose? You know, some of us are going, I've been praying to lose weight for years and it hasn't happened. What are you talking about here? Well, you can't pray to lose weight and then have a Twinkie in your hand, okay? That prayer doesn't go together. And I liken that to praying for our needs, but not asking God to help us lose things in our life that need to go bye-bye. Let me explain. It's a contradiction. It's like having the Twinkie in our hands and praying for, to, to lose weight and saying, God, I need this, I need that. God, show me this. But yet we're holding on to sin. It's, it's a contradiction of a prayer to pray for God to move in a certain way, but we're holding on to fear. Or, you know, we need to be praying, Lord, help me to lose. And matter of fact, this week you can make a list. Lord, help me to lose my impatience. Help me to lose my doubt. Because that's the only way it's going to happen. Ask God to help you lose it. You got to lose it and not find it and never get it back. You, you want to ask God, whatever it might be, Lord, help me to lose this. And here's the rest of it. Help me to lose whatever is stopping me from drawing closer to you. I got to lose that. In fact, I instructed somebody this week. They said, man, I'm struggling with this. And they kept going on. And I've done this. I've spent money on this. And it kind of reminded me of the hemorrhaging woman. Remember, she spent all of her money trying to get well. 12 years of her life, Dr. Luke says, nothing helped her until she reached out and touched Jesus. And she was made well. What does that tell us? That only the touch of the Lord Jesus Christ could make us well. And we need to pray, not always to gain, but to lose. Ask for God to, to help it to be God in your life, whatever it might be. That is a miracle of all miracles. And it's, it's, it's a higher level of praying. Again, we should pray for our needs, but we should first pray to lose whatever rotten attitude, whatever faithlessness, whatever thing that, that we can't get rid of on our own and give it over to God because that's what he wants us to do. And God will use those types of moments to show you really what's going on. And it's vital that we, we do that because we want to see God. We want to see who he is. We want to follow him more closely. You know, earlier in the Gospels, and it's found in Matthew, it's found in Mark as well, but here's Luke's account of it. Jesus was having a conversation with his disciples about this whole topic of gaining and losing. Listen to what it says here, starting in verse 23 of chapter 9. Uh, then he said to them all, if anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of me will save it. For what does it benefit someone if he gains the whole world, yet loses and forfeits himself? Verse 26, 
For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and that of the Father and of the holy angels. Now stop right there. How do we follow Jesus? Well, we follow him by just coming to him on his terms, by looking at it from his way, not trying to come up with our own way to see God better, but to follow him this way. Again, what good is it if you gain the whole world? Now, some people are trading God in. Nobody's going to gain the whole world, the riches of the world. They're trading God in for a little temporary pleasure. Well, I got to do this. I got to live this way. This is how I feel. You're trading God in for just that little temporary moment when God has so much more for you. See, we got to trust God that he'll give us the view. He'll help us to see exactly what we need to see. You know, as we close, I'm reminded of this story about a man named Larry Cavett from Los Angeles who did something I think was just a, you know, a harebrained idea. He bought 45 weather balloons. He tied them to a chair, packed a survival sack with him of his favorite candy bars, water, and a BB gun. We'll explain why in a moment. And then he filled all 45 balloons with helium because he wanted to get a good view of the city. And he figured that the balloons, kind of like that movie, up, they would put them up in the air, and he thought, I could get up about two, 300 feet, and I could see everything real nice. And then when I want to come down, I'll take my BB gun, and I'll shoot one balloon at a time. Now, before we go any further, because we don't want to be sued, even though we have attorneys on retainer, do not try this at home, okay? All right, so there it is, okay? Now, the only problem with this idea is he never tried it before, and he didn't go up two or 300 feet, he went up 11,000 feet up in the air. And now he was in some early air space for LAX airport. I would call that a little problem. And so air traffic control, the help with rescue workers, were able to get him down. He was too scared to shoot the BB gun at that height. And so after they brought him down um, safely, they, the police cited him, you know, they ticketed him, and they, and they said to him, will you ever do this again? He said, absolutely not. And he said, they said, why did you do this? He goes, I just wanted to see things a little bit better. And he said, all you had to do was ask. We could have put you in a helicopter, okay? And you could have saw everything just fine. And I look at that story, and I think sometimes that's like us and God. Uh, you know, we try to come up with these harebrained ways to make up the gap, to make up the difference, and to make up for this bad thing we did, or this past that we have, or, you know, uh, we try to come up with all these other religious steps, and, you know, uh, whatever, you know, maybe we try to invent some type of form of charismaniac mentality that we got to be loud and proud for God to hear us, and all the showman stuff, and we see it today, that the church has become, it's more about entertainment than it is edification, um, it's more about division than it is unity, and so I think when God looks at us and he he looks at the temple, our temple, our hearts. He's saying we need to have a prayer like this. Pray to lose it so you could see me very clearly. You know, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. And so as it closes here, Jesus says in verse 27 of Luke 9, Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. What was Jesus? Who was he saying that to? Well, we know Peter and John and James were there as he said that. A few days later, they would have an incredible experience with Jesus. They would be on the Mount of Transfiguration, and they would see a little bit of glory. They would witness a conversation that Jesus would have with Moses, and they would see all of this, and that was a taste of what was to come in heaven. And it's a reminder for all of us, follow God, close the gap, and you have an eternity of blessing waiting for you. Don't settle for here. This is temporary. The Bible makes very clear that our citizenship is in heaven. Yes, you're going to have difficulties and pains, but don't waste your time and your troubles. Stop trying to fill the balloons up. Let me fill the balloons up. Let, let me go to a fortune teller to tell me my future. Don't worry about somebody who thinks they can read the stars. Focus on the one who's hung the stars. Keep that in mind. Let me not trust in anybody who could promise some version of healing. Let me go to the great physician. And even in this life, if I don't get the answers to the prayers that I want, I'm not concerned because this isn't my home. That God has made certain promises to those who choose to follow him closely like this. That he sent his son, as it were, on this first Palm Sunday so that nobody in all of history, including you and I, sinners like you and I, that we would not have to be at an arm's distance from God. That the sacrifice of Christ on the cross and the empty tomb in Jerusalem would guarantee you and I a fellowship with God now and a home in heaven to come. Because no matter what, we stand before a higher judge. You know, as we close, uh, one more story I want to share. is about a 94-year-old man uh, by the name of Leon Schwarzenbaum, 
who survived the Holocaust, of all things. And as faith would have it, the man, the Nazi who was in charge of his death camp, as it was called, was being tried for his crimes. He was responsible for the death of 170,000 people, including 35 members of this man's family. And so it came time, and he was able to face the man and share a few things with him. And he said to him something very poignant that I want you to hear. He said, soon we will both stand in front of a judge higher than this in the highest court we will stand before the highest judge. Come clean and tell everyone what you've done. And I think that's a reminder here that Jesus is the highest court in the land. It's not, well, thank God it's not people's court, okay, and, or judge this or that, okay. It's not the Staten Island Supreme Court. It's not the Circuit of Appeals. It's certainly not the Supreme Court. The highest court of all is God's court. And he is the one who we will stand before one day. And God was presenting his son as a reminder of that. And as we close, it says that as Jesus came, we see this word. It says people were stirred. It comes from the Greek word seismos. It's where we use the word seismograph to determine the size of an earthquake. That Jesus had brought a shaking when he came on that first Palm Sunday. And let that be a prayer for you and for, for me tonight. That God shake me up, as it were, on this Palm Sunday, 2000. 22, whatever I'm going through, whether it's pain that has been brought upon my doorstep, whether it's distance that I've caused because of bad decisions, whatever it might be, God, shake me as you're presenting your son before me once again. Help me to identify whatever's causing distance, to pray, not to gain, but to lose whatever's getting in my way with you. Because your son, Jesus Christ, is the King of kings and the Lord of Lords. One day every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess to that truth. And we want to make sure that our eyes are fixed on Jesus Christ, who is the author and the perfecter of our faith. Let us settle for nothing less than having a close relationship with God. For after all, the very first Palm Sunday, God was presenting his son into the holy city before these people and before you and I so that we could close the gap and we can walk and follow after Christ. If you believe that, say amen.